All right, so Mr. Anderson, um, while we're recording, I think now would be a good time for us to discuss any illegal activities we might be involved in. Uh, we're actually not six feet apart, so we're probably not far enough apart to meet state standards for uh, the flu we're in. No, oh, I, I just think, you know, while I'm recording myself, that's like a really good time to talk about any kind of, you know, secret illegal activities that I might be doing behind the scenes. Well, you know, Richard Nixon didn't trust anyone. He yeah. didn't himself. So why don't you tape everything? Tape everything. Richard Nixon, president at the close of the Vietnam War. Remember, we talked about his plan, his silver bullet plan to end the war in Vietnam, Vietnamization. That was a resounding success. Nope. No. Good. South yeah. Vietnam falls to communism. And then in the twilight of Nixon's presidency, he becomes mired in one of the most infamous political scandals in United States history. The Watergate. the Watergate scandal. Now, here's the thing. Nixon, like Mr. Anderson said, was super paranoid. So he recorded everything. He had secret recordings of all the conversations he had in his office. Well, it turns out he recorded himself talking to people about illegal things that he was involved in. And it turns out that if you're going to do something illegal, one of the worst things that you can do is, like, record it. Like, it's like if I was like, hey, guys, I'm going to go and, um, and shoplift, and I'm going to record myself doing it on Facebook. So my friends can all see how cool I am right before I go to jail and get charged tens of thousands of dollars in civil reparations, right? And not only did he, when he taped himself, when he had, when they, uh, uh, Told that he had to turn all his tapes in. There was 15 minutes on one of the tapes that just all of a sudden went blank. <laughs> oh, I wonder how that happened. happened. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was an accident. So, um, oh, and then I think like one of them had like uh, 20 minutes of the Beatles recorded. It. No, that's that's not true. All right. So anyway, Nixon um, became obsessed because the press was getting all these stories. All these things were leaking from his administration, and he wanted to find the leaks. He wanted to know who was leaking information. And so he hired a bunch of like ex-cops, you know, detectives, and he called them the plumbers because plumbers fix leaks, <laughs> right? So, so plumbers fix leaks. Well, it, they were basically just a, a band of, of, of criminals, hooligans, hooligans right? Um, and then they decided, or Nixon, you know, decided that they would break into the offices of his political opponents to try to figure out what was going on. And so these plumbers break into the National Democratic Headquarters, which was the Watergate Hotel. Right. And so here he's got guys that he's hired to break into the hotel that houses the headquarters of his political opponents. They're in there to steal um, papers, and they're in there to put bug, bugging devices, basically devices in the telephones, so he can listen to the telephone conversation. Now they might have gotten away with it, but a guard noticed that a uh, like a piece of paint had been put over one of the little you know door latch things, and so the whole thing comes out that he, he tore it off, and then he came back and was putting back on, and then he called the cops. <laughs> so these guys were not exactly like pros at the job either like if you're uh, if you're gonna hire cronies henchmen you know like uh you know like if you're you're threatening you're hiring foot soldiers you know make sure they know uh what they're doing these guys obviously um were kind of like amateurs right so it all comes out that nixon is involved in all of this illegal activity break-ins wiretapping his opponents um and this collectively is referred to as the watergate scandal now, Nixon is, is just, yeah, he's just like, no, I'm not, a crook. I'm not a crook, right? Famously says that when he was just caught red-handed doing all of this stuff. Um, and he's staring down the barrel of impeachment, for sure. Uh, but ultimately, it doesn't come to that because he resigns. He resigns. And Nixon, uh, and if you look at this picture over here, this is Nixon climbing aboard Marine One. Um, for the last time, his presidency coming to an end, and Nixon will resign in disgrace. Well, his vice president's going to take over. You know, his first vice president, Sparrow Agnew. That's what happened to Sparrow Agnew. He was arrested. 
and had to leave office. So Ford tried to find someone who was uh, a clean caliber, a guy that was known for his ethics. So he picks Gerald Ford to be his vice president. And when Nixon's forced to leave office in disgrace, Ford takes over for Nixon. Mm -hmm. Now when Ford takes over, what's the big mistake that Ford does? He pardons Nixon. When he mm -hmm. pardons Nixon, that means Nixon's never gonna go to trial. But when Ford runs to be president, a lot of people are upset about him pardoning Nixon, and he basically loses the next election to Jimmy Carter because of that pardon. The Watergate scandal is going to echo across time and basically become like the 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 sort of um, what would you call it? Like uh, the basis of comparison for future presidential scandals. So the Clinton administration, the White most Water. recent uh, Whitewater, um, the most recent impeachment scandal with Donald Trump. They're going to compare it to Watergate. They're going to look at Watergate as the, the modern example of a major presidential scandal. Is it worse? Is it better? What are the outcomes going to be? And it's probably going to continue to be the case. This was probably the only presidency that actually had a chance of being actually taken oh, yeah. down. Yeah, he, he had a pretty good chance of actually being impeached. So if you think back to um, 1898, remember we talked about the Spanish-American War. You remember that the United States said that we had a right to intervene in Cuban affairs. Well, we've been intervening a lot in Cuban affairs since then, haven't we? Oh. Say between now all the way up until the, the 1960s. There's a guy in Cuba. His name is Batista. And he's not great for the Cuban people, but he's really good for a little company called United Fruit. United Fruits, like the evil king of Latin America and the Caribbean. Well, along comes this guy named Fidel Castro. And what does Castro do? He plays baseball, not soccer. He plays baseball, not soccer. Which is funny because most communist dictators are soccer. Guys. You would think that he would play soccer. But he does. He's a baseball guy. And he leads this rebellion against this Cuban-led government by the Americans. Right. And he, he does a couple of things that the United States doesn't really like. One thing that he does is he nationalizes all of the land in Cuba. So basically he says, okay, this land now doesn't belong to United Fruit and the Americans. It belongs to me and the Cuban people. All right. But there was a really big problem with Castro that was even more serious than, than nationalizing all that fruit land. He was, a communist. he was communist. Are we able to, can we allow Cuba to be communist? Not according to the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine says if we let Cuba fall to communism, then the next thing you know, it'll be uh, the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, and, and pretty soon we'll be surrounded by communists. We've got to contain it like the coronavirus. Contain it like the coronavirus. So um, the United States is going to repeatedly try to get rid of Castro. And this gets a little ridiculous. So, like, uh, so they, they made like an exploding seashell and put it where he liked to go scuba diving. Um, they tried to poison his milkshake. They tried to poison his cigars. They even hired like his girlfriend to try to assassinate him. She lost her move and didn't do it. Right, so there's all these like, kind of like, it's like, why, you ever see like Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner? That's basically how I imagine like the CIA is like Wiley Coyote trying to kill the Roadrunner over and over and over again um, in sort of ridiculous ways. Well, anyway. Fidel Castro, when he takes over, what happens to Batista and all his followers? They wind up going not that far north. They wind up going to Florida. Mm -hmm. So you got this huge, large Cuban population moving into Florida that are they're expatriates. They're, they, they left Cuba because they're afraid of the communist government led by Castro. They're anti-Castro, and they are eager to see Castro get removed and for them to be able to return to power. Um, and so the United States, through the CIA, comes up with a plan where they will basically train all of these sort of um, Cuban expatriates, and then they're going to arm them. They're going to arm them with, um, you know, some equipment, um, and, and they're going to give them even some planes, some World War II era planes that they're going to paint with markings to make it look like, the idea is it's going to look like they came maybe from somewhere in South America, that basically the United States can have plausible deniability. They can say, oh, it wasn't us. 
you know, uh, this is an operation just completely planned and led by Cuban expatriates and the U.S. has nothing to do with it. Um, well, here's the thing. Uh, they had really, really bad operational security. And so Castro basically knew that this was going to happen like a year before it happened. So uh, the plan was for this force to invade in a place called the uh, Bay of Cachinos, the Bay of Pigs, right? And when the invasion was launched, guess who was waiting on the beach? The communists, the communists Castro, and his military. Um, and to make matters worse, the, the, uh, the, these Cuban expatriate forces thought that there would be a popular uprising. Well, it turns out Castro was kind of popular with the Cuban people. And so that... Uh, uprising didn't materialize. And so these guys literally got slaughtered on the beaches um, in the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was a complete um, tactical and strategic disaster as an operation goes, but it did make Kennedy look good. Well, what happened too is this plan was actually started under Eisenhower. Yeah, right. And Eisenhower handed this ball off to Kennedy, and the Bay of Pigs actually gave them a bit of a black eye because it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. So, because of this, the Cubans aren't going to trust the Americans. Oh, for sure. The Americans aren't going to trust the Cubans. So, who are the Cubans going to cuddle next to? They're going to start cuddling up with the Soviets. Soviets. Right. So, uh, Kennedy was a, a Navy lieutenant during World War II, whereas Eisenhower was, you know, supreme Allied commander. So, there was a lot of reluctance on Kennedy's part to really change this plan in any fundamental way because it was Eisenhower's plan. Um, but the. the well, it's kind of ironic that a lot of people at the time said that Kennedy was soft on communism. And so even though the Bay of Pigs was a failure, some people said, well, yeah, you know, Kennedy's being tough on communism. And so it was actually a little bit of a political win for him. So our problems with Castro and Cuba are going to persist. We're not going to manage to oust Castro. The Bay of Pigs failed. All of these sort of half-witted kind of assassination attempts failed. He actually died of old age not that long ago. Are, are we going to trust the Cubans? We're not going to so trust the Cubans. what do we Cuba. start flying over Cuba? U-2 spy planes. We're going to fly Bono? We're going to fly Bono over Cuba. And he is going to play his guitar and take pictures. No, the U-2 is a high-altitude spy plane. That up until, um, you know, later in the 1960s is able to fly higher than anti-air missiles. And so it just flies way, way up in the air. And then it has a special camera that allows it to take very detailed photos of, of the ground below it. Um, and uh, in 1962, uh, the United States U-2 spy planes took some very interesting photos over Cuba. What did they find? They found that there was nuclear warheads and missiles being put into Cuba. So Castro and Khrushchev, Khrushchev was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, had conspired together and they had put medium range ballistic missiles in Cuba. Now these are, are you know, not intercontinental ballistic missiles, but they can fly thousands of miles. So they can go really far and they can reach just about anywhere in the United States or anywhere from Cuba to the United States within minutes. So there'd be almost no warning. And remember, we talked about how devastating these weapons are, right? So the Soviet Union stationed these nuclear missiles in Cuba just miles off of the Florida coast. And then what, uh, so Kennedy is president, and Kennedy turns to his military advisors and, you know, people like Curtis LeMay. Right? Attack them. They say, let's attack them. Curtis LeMay says, let's attack Oh, hang on, I got my mother-in-law. All right, we'll have to call her back. So uh, Kennedy's military advisors say, let's attack Cuba. Let's hit it from the air. We're going to bomb Cuba from the air, and then we're going to quickly follow that up with a ground invasion. Now, what would have happened if we had tried to invade Cuba in this area? Eventually, some Soviet soldiers would have been killed which means the Soviets would have to respond because you can't be attacked and not, you know, be attacked or you're going to look soft. And eventually what would happen is you'd have the Soviets shooting at Americans and this Cold War would turn hot 
we would probably have the first nuclear war, which would probably be the end of humanity as we knew it. Here's something really scary, and we didn't know about this until the 1990s, over 30 years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Who can authorize the use of nuclear weapons in the United States? President can. Only the president can authorize the use of nuclear weapons in the United States. But during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviet nuclear weapons on the ground, those could be authorized by anyone. So any Soviet military officer on the ground could have decided to use uh, certain types of nuclear weapons. They actually had very short range, what were called tactical nuclear weapons. So these are not like the big rockets that go way up and then hit things thousands of miles away. These are tactical nuclear weapons. So they just move a short distance across the battlefield. And the idea was, okay, if the United States sends in the Marines, then we can nuke the amphibious landing force. Imagine if, imagine if, like we talked about D-Day during World War II. Imagine all of those troops coming up the beach during D-Day, storming the beaches of Normandy, and then all of a sudden they get hit with small nuclear weapons. That invasion would have been stopped dead in its tracks, and that's what the Soviets were thinking. Now here's the thing: those Soviet officers on the ground would have gotten awfully nervous to see all those American Marines storming the beaches. Do you think they would have fired those nukes if they had them? You bet. Now, the Soviets nuke our Marines. What do we do to the Soviets? We nuke them back. We, we let our missiles fly. We launch our bombers. What are they going to do at the same time? Hundreds of millions of people would die in just 72 hours. Uh, I think it's something like 80 to 90 million people in the United States would have been killed in just three days. And that's just with the initial attack. It would have been World War III. It would have been nuclear. It would have been really bad. All right. What does what does Kennedy decide to do? Kennedy decides not to listen to his military advisors, who are almost all telling him to invade. He doesn't listen to them. Instead, he decides to impose an economic um, and military blockade around a Cuba, naval. a naval blockade. So he surrounds Cuba with ships, and he says no ships are going to be allowed in and out. Um, and he orders, he tells the Soviet Union that they have to remove their missiles from Cuba. And he says that any attack, um, any missile launched from Cuba against any target will be viewed as the Soviet Union attacking the United States. And he says the United States will respond in kind. Now, eventually what happens is, is that the United States doesn't want a, a, a nuclear war. Uh, the Soviets don't want a nuclear war. Nikita Khrushchev definitely does not want a nuclear war. And the two starts negotiating. Now, compromise, people think nowadays compromise is a bad word, but this country was built on compromise. Compromise is the basis of our nation. So we have a compromise that happens. We say that, that uh, the Soviets have to leave Cuba. We decide, uh, we make an agreement that we were going to take our missiles out of uh, Turkey anyway, because we now had nuclear submarines. But we were going to deny that we were going to take our missiles out, but the Soviets were going to tell their people that they were going to take the missiles out of Cuba, and we were taking our missiles out of Turkey. And this is how the Cuban Missile Crisis has ended. And in actuality, the famous saying is, is that we were in a staring contest with the enemy, and the enemy won. Bleak. Say bleak. But it was actually a compromise. It was. And both sides had to make concessions to avoid this cataclysm that would have been World War III. Still, despite all of these backroom dealings and compromise, this was really bad. Because you had lots and lots of American planes. You had Soviet warships. You had Soviet troops Submarines. and anti-aircraft guns. You had all of these military forces from the Soviet Union and the United States all really close to each other. And so individual incidents on the ground could have quickly boiled over into a larger conflict that could have destroyed life on the earth as we know it. And after the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's like a shock to the system. Both Khrushchev and Kennedy come away with it with a realization that there need to be clear lines of communication. And so they actually install like a hotline between the Kremlin and the White House so that those two leaders can directly talk to each other. This, this is going to cost Khrushchev. Premier, yeah. because the Soviets looked at him as being weak, and they're going to replace Khrushchev with a guy that's a hard-line communist, a guy by the name of Brezhnev. Brezhnev. 
Brezhnev, who also, um, toward the end of his uh, reign, had pretty late stage dementia and was hallucinating and um, uh, had all sorts of, of uh, issues that you don't want somebody that's in charge of a nuclear arsenal to have. Very true. So throughout the, pretty much the, from 1949, when the Soviets explode their first nuclear weapon, all the way up until really the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Americans live sort of in this constant fear of total nuclear annihilation. Like the Cuban Missile Crisis was close, you know, um, uh, and so it's this constant threat that at any moment the air raid sirens could go off and that you would then have to rush to the bomb shelter, to the fallout shelter, and prepare for Soviet nuclear missiles to rain down, for bombs from Soviet bombers to rain down and annihilate American cities. I was actually in middle, uh, 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 I was in elementary school in the 1970s. That's how old I am. And in Michigan in the 1970s, we were the automakers, and everyone talked about how the Soviets would nuke Detroit and nuke Flint to destroy our uh, abilities to make weapons. And when I was a little kid, I remember, you know, it, it, they only did it when I was in preschool and first and second grade. We used to have drills. We would have nuclear drills where they would have us go under our desk. Because do you know what stops radiation? On top, top of the desk. On top of the desk. I bet you didn't know that. There's three things. There's three things you have to worry about in a nuclear strike. Heat, blast, and radiation. And a desk top covers, covers all, all three. I don't know why they still build a whole school you know, like it, uh, the temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun stop cold when they uh, uh, encounter that point, a that cold, desk. Uh, school desk. Yeah. So and that, that video right there, Dr. Carver, when I was a little kid, they used to show us that movie. They actually had a movie screen. They put the movie screen yeah. up and we'd watch it duck and cover. I would encourage you guys to go and check out this video. You could just type in Fruit the Turtle says duck and cover on YouTube. And it's it's good for a laugh. Um, it, it's funny. We can look back on it. We can laugh a little bit, but there's literally people, you know, ducking under a picnic blanket. Here comes the Soviet nuke, and it's and I'm going to cover myself in a picnic blanket, and that's going to stop all the alpha radiation. That's going to stop the the heat and blast of a of a thermonuclear weapon. Remember, we showed you guys the size of these weapons. This is um, either Hiroshima or Nagasaki, right? And these are small bombs compared to what exists just 10 years later, 20 years later. Uh, you're not going to survive this thing. Now, here's the thing. The government urged citizens to build bomb shelters in backyards and basements. Mr. Anderson, would a, would a bomb shelter in your backyard or basement have saved you from a nuclear attack? Uh, it might from the original, but you'd die from the aftermath from all the dropouts. You would almost certainly, if you were anywhere within the blast radius oh, of the blast bomb, radius, no. you would be dead and your bomb shelter would be your tomb. Okay? That's basically what it would serve for. Now, like Mr. Anderson said, even if you're, let's say that you live farther out from, the, from where this nuclear weapon hit, remember that when these nuclear weapons hit, they throw tremendous amounts of debris and dust high 10,000 feet up in the atmosphere. And it's got all this gamma radiation in it. And that gamma radiation can attach to water droplets and dust particulates. So whatever the gamma radiation gets on, it stays. Um, and so, for example, thank you, buddy. I've received a package from Amazon. Okay. We'll look at it later. All right. All right. See you later. So let's say that it rains and the rain comes down from these clouds with gamma radiation. That gets in the soil. The plants grow, they have gamma radiation. The cow eats the plant, now the cow has gamma radiation. You eat the cow, now you have the gamma radiation. So this fallout is, is going to be very pervasive. It's going to last for a long time. And so you're thinking about tremendous amounts of these nuclear weapons fired. Pretty, uh, but the vast majority of the people on Earth are going to die. And it's actually dangerous for the government to urge citizens to build bomb shelters. Why would it be dangerous for uh, the government to urge citizens to build bomb shelters? What does that make people more tolerant of? Nuclear weapons. They're also, when you have a bomb shelter, you're boarding stuff. Right. Or it's boarding stuff in those bomb shelters. Right. Like beans, toilet, toilet paper. paper. Hey, yeah, that's what you need during the nuclear holocaust, toilet paper. And the coronavirus. And the coronavirus. So, but think about that. 
Mr. Anderson and I go and dig a big hole and build a giant uh, concrete sarcophagus in it and then fill it chock full of toilet paper. And now Mr. Anderson and I are like, you know what? Nuclear war would be okay. We've got all the toilet paper we need, all the beans that we need. We'll be okay. So we are now more comfortable with the idea of nuclear war, even though in reality, we're both goners. Yeah. So it's actually very dangerous that a lot of Americans were building these shelters because they had a false sense of security. Why did the government do that? Because they wanted people to not be terrified. Because people that are scared are going to act differently than people that are comfortable. Right. They want people to go about their lives, go to work, and produce for the economy, and they don't want them to just shut down. So they're trying to give them a false sense of security, but that is a little bit dangerous. So in this time of, of, of threat, in this time of the threat of nuclear annihilation, we'll even proceed in that a little bit, but um, uh, people are very paranoid. Um, and Americans, there's a lot of fear and hysteria surrounded spies, spies among us. They're, your neighbor could be communist. Mr. Anderson could be communist. Now, so I should watch him and make sure that he's not, you know, reading any Ayn Rand books or, you know, doing anything that's a little suspicious. I might have to call my, you know, uh, local police department and report it. Right. So the, uh, the Russians developed uh, this. This really stems from um, the Russians had a, a ton of spies in our atomic program. Um, and that's how they were able to develop nuclear weapons so quickly. So by 1949, they were able to explode their first atomic bomb. And that's because of these two folks right here. These are the Rosenbergs. And so they were actually able to smuggle um, atomic secrets from American labs. And, and they would use like uh, their groceries. And so they actually like would use like a jello box. And then they would have miniaturized versions of the schematics and, and math calculations and things like that. And they would be inside of like that jello box and they would smuggle them out. Well, this became um, widely known. And the Rosenbergs were actually tried and executed for treason. And that is unique in history. They were both given the electric chair. And don't get it wrong, like, uh, this was very comfortable. And even a lot of people at the time were like, hey, you know, maybe this isn't the way we want to go. You know, this seems like a bad idea. Like, we're going down a dark path here. But they both were executed for spying for the Soviets. Um, another person, um, uh, very famous from this time, um, uh, convicted of spying for the Soviets was Alger Hiss. He actually works, I think, for the State Department. Alger Hiss was one of the designers of the UN. Yeah, he was, he was a major, major player in the UN. And you got to remember, in the 1930s, the Soviets were not our enemy. You know, during the oh, war, no. the Soviets were our friend. But when the war ended, not all of a sudden, anyone who had ties to the Soviets was to be suspected. And they accused him. And the guy that actually was in touch with was a guy by the name of Richard Milhouse Nixon, mm -hmm. who was a junior congressman at the time. And Richard Nixon becomes famous starting what we know this thing called the Red Scare. He actually showed like where he had supposedly hidden film inside of a hollowed out gourd or pumpkin. Um, and they, it was very highly televised. But and so Nixon they, uh, became kind of well known for, for his red yeah, scare. Yeah. And the thing is, is Alger Hiss was brought before this, uh, br uh, brought before the Congress and accused of being a spy. But he denied it and denied and denied. And there was no solid proof that we could find that he was a spy for the Soviets. They did get him for perjury. They got him for perjury, so he went to prison for perjury. It wasn't until the 1990s that we actually found out, yes, Alger Hiss was a Soviet spy. And the thing is, is we talk about the Soviets spying on us, and it makes us feel uneasy. It makes us feel uncomfortable. But as much spying as the Soviets were doing, guess what we were doing? We were doing the exact same thing. We had spies everywhere. Remember, this is a cold war. We're not shooting at each other, but we are constantly prying into the other person's business. We were looking at them. We were trying to find out what are the Soviets up to? What is their next step so we can beat them to the punch? And speaking of fear and hysteria, enter Joe McCarthy. Old tail gunner Joe. Old tail gunner Joe. Hey, Mr. Anderson, I have a list. I have a list of everybody in the government who's a communist. I can't show you the list. Though. Top secret. And and then let's say, let's say, uh, I think that, I think, uh, you know, let's say that Mr. Anderson and I are political opponents. 
Now, Mr. Anderson, go ahead and say something bad about me. Mr. Pierce needs to shave. His beard isn't very nice. Mr. Anderson's on the list. He's on the list. He's a communist. He's on the list. I have it right here. Well, let's see what's inside the package. Oh, well, you can't. Because I'm not lying. Yeah, you're a communist. Well, I don't I don't need the top secret. Of, yeah. But I got to trust this guy. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't work well. Joe McCarthy uh, basically used an old formula, right? So people are terrified of communists. Joe McCarthy set himself up as the crusader against communism. He said he had a list of all the people in the United States government that were con uh, that were communists and that he was going to root them out and expose them. He had all these fake charts and graphs that he would show people. He's like a really bad Santa Claus. He's like a really bad Santa Claus. Suck it, you know, yeah. Suck it, suck it twice. Yeah. And the thing is, is that there's people in the government, a lot of people work in the federal government, and there's names like John Smith. Mm -hmm. Well, how many John Smiths are there? Out of those John Smiths, one might be a communist. But old tail gunner Joe here would look and say, oh, well, John Smith, he, he's accused of being a communist, and the guy might have no ties to communism, but he can't defend himself because of that little uh, um, ma uh, manelic envelope that says top secret that has this stuff about John Smith. He can't say, oh, that's John Smith that works in the post office. I don't work in the post office. You can't defend yourself. And what happens is you get this thing McCarthyism, where you go out and you start accusing people based on rumor, not necessarily having hardcore facts. You say, you're associated with so-and-so, you're associated with so-and-so, therefore you are guilty. Think back to English class when you read The Crucible. The Crucible was about the witch hunt in Salem. And all somebody had to do to ruin somebody else or to basically put them on the, the gallows was to say, I saw you. Practicing witch. witchcraft. You're a witch. And and the crucible was actually written in the wake of this uh you know McCarthyism, of this hysteria. Remember, now, uh, yeah. Do you know who Miller was married to? She was married to the blonde uh, blonde bombshell. Marilyn Monroe. Monroe. Ah. That's right. He stole her from Joe DiMaggio. Ah. And Kennedy. <laughs> That's a little McCarthyism there. We don't have any proof. <laughs> so uh, but um anyway. Uh, anybody that worked that uh, was in the know really knew McCarthy was was full of it. So a lot of the people in the higher echelons of government knew McCarthy was was basically uh, you know it was all a show. But they were afraid to take McCarthy on directly because he had a, a very popular following. Remember, a lot of people in the United States were terrified of communism, and so McCarthy could wield that like a weapon. If you challenged McCarthy. He could just beat you over the head with it and, and, not, have to and not have to prove anything. And Eisenhower was the president near the end of it. He said, okay, going to Eisenhower, why don't you stop McCarthy? Why don't you stop McCarthy? And Eisenhower's answer was, is I'm giving him enough rope so that he can hang himself. And guess what? He, he does. Hangs himself. He ends yeah. up accusing a lot of, uh, uh, a number of very well-respected military leaders. Marshall. He re uh, and among them, uh, remember we talked about General George Marshall, the the arch, not the architect, but the guy that executes the Marshall Plan, the guy behind the Berlin Airlift, hero of World War II and the early days of the Cold War. And when he accuses George C. Marshall of being a communist, guess what? He got he had that, like uh, Mr. Anderson said, that enough rope to hang himself. So McCarthy is um, censured by Congress. Um, he's admonished by his peers, and he's looked at as a fraud. Across the nation, and eventually he uh, dies of a heart attack. Yeah. He becomes an alcoholic because he goes from this huge figure, huge figure in Washington. Remember, we're not talking about MacArthur being this massive, important political leader in Wisconsin. He's from Wisconsin. He's a junior congressman. Right. And then he comes in and he takes over this whole Red Scare, this Red Scare menace. And what happens is, is at the end, he's, you know, he's made all these accusations, you know, these accusations that he can't back up. And he becomes a word, McCarthyism, someone who accuses someone with no real uh, uh, backbone. This was a dark time in the United States. Many people had to come and testify before Congress um, uh, about their beliefs and if they had any affiliation with, with communism. And there were countless celebrities. When to come testify before Congress, you had uh, uh, all sorts of people um, who really hadn't done anything illegal, 
but they were called before Congress. Have you or uh, are you or have you ever been communist? Um, have you ever attended a meeting um, about communists? They were asking. Yeah. You're blacklisted and you couldn't get a job. Guys like uh, Will Gear. Now, have mm-hmm. you guys ever watched The Wall? The TV show The Waltons from the 70s. He was Grandpa Walton. Grandpa Walton in the 1950s couldn't find a job because he was he was labeled a communist and was blacklisted. There was a band back then called the Weavers, and they were really popular in the early 50s. And they got accused of being communist and they were blacklisted. And no one would publish their records. So they'd make a record and no one would take it on and publish it. They were ruined. Their careers were ruined. Famous athletes. Uh, who was the athlete that was? Uh, baseball players um, and boxers. I know boxers were. I can't remember the baseball player, but you know, this whole concept of, of being associated with communism. Oh, Jackie was, Robinson. Yeah, but they, they said that because of his race. Yeah. He really yeah. had no ties. To no, communism. he had no ties to communism. But whatsoever. they were trying to ruin Jackie but Robinson because of his race. But they called him before the, the committee because he was black and tried to make him testify as to whether or not it, just just the fact that he had to do it. Um, was a violation of his rights. He was an American citizen who hadn't done anything wrong, and he was being called to testify before Congress, you know, and so he was caught up in this hysteria. And I think Muhammad Ali. Later on, Muhammad yeah. Ali was. Mm-hmm. That's because he wouldn't go to Vietnam. So eventually, um, the, you know, McCarthy is exposed as a fraud and lives out the rest of his short life in, in relative obscurity. Um, but the term McCarthyism is stuck. And so when you hear the term McCarthyism, it's making false accusations based on rumor or guilt by association. Okay, guys, so, uh, you know, we we live relatively close to the Hampton Roads area. So if you've ever been over to Hampton Roads or if you've ever been up into Northern Virginia, you know you can't throw a rock without hitting a two-letter agency, a military base, or a military contractor. So you have the Pentagon, you have Joint Base Langley Eustis, you have Meyer Henderson Hall, you've got Norfolk Naval Weapons Station, you have all of these military bases, you have all of these um, private businesses that provide the government and the military with services like the shipyard is a really good example of that. Um, and so during the Cold War, Virginia's economy is actually going to reap a considerable benefit. Um, uh, you know, it's really important during the Cold War for the United States to be on the bleeding edge of technology. And so we have to, and that's an advantage that we have over the Soviets. The Soviets are, um, have high tech weapons, but they're really bad miniaturization, especially where computers are involved. And so we are able to keep a technological edge over them throughout the Cold War. And that research and development, all of those big military contracts, Virginia is going to be the benefit of most of them. Defense contractors are private businesses that sell goods and services related to defense. So like Raytheon, um, like Boeing, um, like General Dynamics. All of these very big companies are going to get billions of dollars developing new, better weapons um, and providing services, um, uh, you know, for the U.S. government. And during this time period, the areas like Middlesex, Middlesex for the longest time was uh, just our whole survival was the base. But then when we get to the Cold War, a lot of people started getting <laughs> jobs in Hampton Roads. A lot of people started getting jobs working in Fort Houston. A lot of people had jobs working for this military industry, this, this military uh, uh, money pot that was the, uh, the money maker for this area. And that's one of the reasons why, if you compare East Virginia to the Western part of our state, the Eastern part has more money. And the Eastern part has more money because there aren't any military bases out near Wilmington or out near Lee County. They're too far away. But along the coast, this whole coast is full of military bases. And with military bases, you have people going to these military bases. You're going to have movie theaters. You're going to have places for the soldiers to go when they get off the base. It's going to it's going to uh, make our economy boom here in Virginia. And the problem is, it's just like I grew up in Michigan. In Michigan, our economy was based on the auto industry. And when the auto industry went down, our economy went. 
Everything was tied to the auto industry. When that left, our economy was shot. Virginia is tied to the federal government, the military. If for some reason the United States decides to move the capital from Washington to Lincoln, Nebraska, Virginia wouldn't recover from that because the bulk of our economy is based up there near Washington, D.C. All these military bases. I mean, we almost lost uh, uh, the, uh, they almost, uh, you know, the uh, Atlantic Fleet Station here in Virginia. We almost lost that to Florida. If we lost that, that would have been a huge hit to our economy. Our economy is so tied. Think about how many Virginia. people you know that work at the shipyard. Oh, I mean, that's a huge of amount of, um, of uh, money income. coming into the Virginia economy. Um, uh, and in space, um, like, you know, you have NASA Langley. Well, um, you know, the Wallops Island Space Launch Facility employs thousands of Virginians. It's like one of the only spaceports in the United States. So this continues to be a major benefit. So there's a lot of money coming into the Virginia economy during the Cold War.